I'm going to go ahead and start the recording. So welcome to everybody who's just joined. Uh, if you are entering and um, not on mute for any reason, if you can go ahead and just make sure that you're muted, we're going to uh, keep everybody on mute because we've got a lot of people registered for this webinar today. All right, I'm admitting a few more people. Um, so welcome. My name is Caroline Sell. I'm the Central Chesapeake Field School Manager for Future Harvest. Um, and that means that I coordinate a lot of the programming that's usually on farm, um, but happens throughout the region. Uh, so a couple housekeeping things quickly, just before we get started. Um, we wanted to point out some of the resources that Future Harvest has available. I'm gonna go ahead and share those in the chat box um, in a couple of minutes. If you go down to the bottom of your screen, if you're on a computer, you'll be able to see on the left um, a mute button, a stop video button, um, and then if you scroll over to the little chat bubble, you'll see it's opening up a chat box. So I'm gonna type in here and say hello to everyone. Um, so if you have any questions during the presentation, instead of unmuting yourself because there's so many of us, please type that into the chat box. Um, if you have joined us by phone and you're not able to use the chat box for whatever reason, you can feel free to, um, to email me after the presentation or during the presentation if there's a way that you have access to internet. My email is caroline at futureharvestcasa.org. I'm gonna put that in here as well. Um, all right, and I'll be sharing some of the Future Harvest COVID-19 resources uh, before we close today, but uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started with the, the basic present, the, the presentation. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll now and it should let us find out a little bit of information about you. Uh, there's just two questions and we just wanted to get a little bit of a sense of what kind of background you'll have in, um, in farming as we get started. So you should see that pop up on your screen. Go ahead and answer it if you're able. Uh, if you don't see it, no worries. Sometimes it takes a couple minutes to show up for everyone. All right. Um, so this is our first ever online hands-on field day. We're trying a new format. Um, so I wanna say a huge thank you to our host farmer, Lisa Duff of Oak Spring Farm. We're gonna introduce her in a second and um, get a little bit further into this. But the hands-on days are part of our uh, field school and also part of the beginning farmer training program. So the field school is events throughout the region normally on farm, a lot more of them are webinars right now, all of them are webinars right now, uh, and we explore a variety of topics. Uh, we cover things having to do with vegetable farming, with livestock, uh, food safety, soil health, pretty much everything you can think of. Um, and I'm gonna hand the camera and microphone over to Sarah Sohn, who's the director of our Beginning Farmer Training Program, to go ahead and explain a little bit about what that is. Hello, everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I I'll, I'll just say very briefly what um, our beginner farmer training program is. It's a free year-long um, program that has three levels designed to serve um, people who are just starting out at that level one to people who are actually um, already managing or own their own farm. Um, let's see. Um, an amazing thing to note here is that Lisa Duff, our, our amazing farmer host here, is a graduate of the program and has come full circle and now is a trainer um, in the program. Um, and so I'm, I'm super excited to hear from her. Um, let's see, the hands-on days are typically ones that are meant to, Lisa had originally um, agreed to host on her farm a hands-on day designed to help expose some of our level one entry-level farmers to um, just some basic farm tasks and fundamental farm tasks, one of them being bed preparation. Um, but obviously in the current situation, uh, we've sort of um, tried to put our heads together to figure out how to convey some of this stuff without physically um, being together. So um, hopefully um, this will work. It would be great to get feedback. Um, in terms of the BFTP, if any of you are interested for future seasons, our applications for 2021 will open up in mid-August. Um, but yeah, that, that's about it for me. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And um, I've just put in the chat box a link to some of our resources around COVID-19, including um, a Find a Farmer map in the past webinar, uh, 
and best practices for safety at farmers markets and on farm. And I've also just sent along a link to uh, the information on our website about the beginning farmer training program. All right, wonderful. Um, so yeah, like Sarah said, Lisa is a graduate of the beginning farmer training program and now is a training farm for lots of folks. Um, Lisa, I'm gonna go and hand it over to you. Okay. Hi everybody, can you hear me okay? You can do a thumbs up. I can't see that many of you, but yeah, we're good. Okay. So today we're going to focus on bed prep. I'll tell you a little bit about Oak Spring. Um, I am the chief cook and bottle washer. I live here on the farm with my three kids, 16, 14, and 10. And I've been farming here. I've lived here since 2006 and you're fine, honey. Go ahead. I have a teenager now running in the background. Um, we've been farming here. Well, we moved here in 2006. I went through the beginner farmer training program in 2012, and that's when I really became a market farmer. Um, my mentors are Jack Gurley, Jack and Becky Gurley, and they taught me a lot about what it means to really ramp up and, and run a CSA. I had like a 10 member CSA when I started the beginner farmer training program, and I didn't have to make a living farming. Um, I'm a single mom now, and three years ago when I got divorced, I had to make a living farming. So it was, uh, that's when rubber hit the road. And uh, by the grace of God, we're doing it. But it's not easy, but it's a lot of fun. It's the only thing I can imagine doing. So um, we'll go through the slides and you'll learn a little bit more about me and, and how we do things. So it looks like 43% of you own or manage a farm or 26% uh, work on farm. Um, a lot of conventional tillage, which I do too. And there's also uh, plenty of you doing the silage tarps, which is great because I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and the stale seed bed, which we'll talk about. So looks good. Looks like you're in the right place. All right. So let's see if I can do this. I've never done a webinar before. Um, about the farm. Here we go. We've been certified organic since 2013. If you can see the map up in your, um, I guess it's in the upper right. You can see where we are. We're in North Baltimore County. We're in Freeland, uh, almost to Pennsylvania. So pretty much as the crow flies, we're just uh, maybe a couple of miles from, from the Pennsylvania line. Uh, we got certified organic in 2013. That's a year after I did the beginner farmer training program. I live, my, the property I live on with the farmhouse and our barns uh, which you saw one of the barns in that first picture, is four and, about four and a half acres. Um, I also have an acre that I work at Side by Side Farm, which Sarah knows well. And at the end of the day, and I have a half acre across the street, but at the end of the day, I have two total acres in production. Um, we have three hoop houses. So one of them has a heater and I heat it and use it as a greenhouse in the winter and in the spring. Um, that's 5,000 square feet, which is how I've been able to do a, a, a April CSA. Uh, 30 types of crops. We're a CSA farm. We are primarily a CSA farm. Uh, then, so it goes CSA, it, restaurant sales. That's the tier. So when this COVID thing hit, it was um, fairly easy. I don't want to say easy. It was fairly doable to pivot and increase my CSA and hopefully our markets will still be okay. Um, so last year we did about 150,000. I suspect this year it'll be significantly more than that based on what's going on right now. Um, and we have been netting about 40. Um, and we have three employees, lots of volunteers, and sometimes I have part-time employees too who work for me in the summer. Um, our mission, there's my girl group last year. They were awesome. We had a great team uh, in the fall of last year. So um, you can see what our mission is. It's all about trying to stay local as we can. Um, I have not moved into DC area. I'm trying to stay in Baltimore. I'm trying to increase the local food availability to my immediate community as much as possible. I want to I wanna be able to feed as many people as close to me as I can um, and customize well, CSA refers to Harvey. That's um, a CSA platform that we joined last year, which is great. And I can talk more about that at the end. Um, so in our vision, in our vision, it includes, um, it includes education. 
So I have two apprentices this year, whether they're through the BFTP program or not, I have either interns or apprentices. And then I have lots of volunteers who often come here because they want to learn how to grow their own food. Um, so this is a little bit of a repeat um, that I did the I finished the beginner farmer training program in 2012. That's the same year I helped start the Hereford Farmers Market. And the same year that I got my foot in a Woodbury kitchen and started restaurant sales. Um, I uh, went through the nutrient management program. So I'm a certified operator and I write my own plan because I didn't know that I could get it written for free. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I write my own plan. So that's a feather in my cap. That's a lot of work, but um, you know, I guess I know a lot about it. Uh, been certified organic since 2013. We're animal welfare approved. We have a, a flock of laying hens. Um, so I did the gap training, but just the small Maryland gap training. And then I did the ag biz master's program, which is a great program, especially if you want a loan through farm credit. Uh, it's very helpful to help you learn about writing a business plan. It, it gives you, it kind of takes you the extra steps, um, when you need it, it, it pairs well with the beginner farmer training program. So, oh, here's a little video just to show you what our farm looks like, so. So we just took that the other day. That is like where we're at right now in the hoop house. We've got little tunnel cucumbers coming up. Um, you know, we're collecting eggs. There's a basket of nice dirty eggs, which happens when, uh, you know, the nesting boxes don't get cleaned out on a regular basis. Um, the rainbow color I have, uh, I, the animal welfare approved hens I have to raise from chicks from day old. So, um, we, we get white, green, and brown egg layers, and it's fun. Chicks are, chickens are a lot of work, but it's a really nice balance to have them. Um, so, whoops, I don't want to do that again. How do I get to the next slide? There we go. Um, all right, today's topics. We're going to talk about bed prep. We're going to talk about assessing a new site, which we just did, um, and the challenges to keep in mind, how, how we go from pasture to seed bed, uh, how we go from cover crop to cash crop, how we go from uh, cash crop to cash crop, which we do a lot here because you can imagine um, we're, we're going to have 150 CSA members this season and we cultivate two acres. So we are flipping beds and adding a lot of compost. And um, so then cash crop to cover crop and then seeding we're going to talk about. So basically you see the picture of me at the top left. That is fairly recent too. I think Caroline took that when she came up to see me a few weeks ago. Um, so we start seeds in January and I heat the plastic in the back is actually a, a curtain of plastic. So it cuts off my 2000 square foot high tunnel and makes it a small greenhouse. So I don't have to buy as much propane because propane is expensive. Uh, oil is much cheaper. Um, and I do want to say that this is how I do it. This is how we do it at Oak Spring Farm. And I have learned so much more from screwing things up than I have learned from doing it right the first time. I have been at this for a minute. And again, I've only had to make money for three years, but I've been doing this and farming here, you know, pretty, pretty hard since 2012. And I mean, in 2012, I had a two-year-old. So you know, it was still pretty part time, but I was doing a CSA and, um, you know, working at it. So I'm still fairly new in, in terms of how, how much things change here. We're still growing. We're growing every year. So I haven't come to a place where it's uh, consistent, um, but we've learned a lot and we do a lot of things right. And there's things that I know we could do better. Um, so assessing a new area for production. So here's, this is when we had steers. What a mistake that was. We would never do that again. Holy cow. Those two right there, they got out for three weeks. Three weeks. They lived in the neighbor's hundred acres. What a nightmare. That was when I was still married. My husband pretty much stopped working and like had to go on like, you know, recognizance, you know, this, it was insane. We got him back and then we sent him to the butcher. But, um, 
So this area now is the fields that you saw two slides ago. Uh, this area now is plot four and it is, it's, it's probably where we make the most money on cash crops. So when we started this area, it was just, first of all, we have a lot of clay. So we have like clay loam, that's our soil, um, a lot of rocks. And there was, thank God, no thistle, but um, lots of lambs, quarters, lots of uh, sheep sorrel in here. And just, and, and a little bit of that um, Johnson grass. I don't know if it's Bermuda grass or Johnson grass, to be honest. I, I haven't ever researched it enough, enough to know exactly which is which, but a, a pervasive, invasive grass. So what we did back then to flip these beds, till. We tilled, we measured it off, we tilled, and then we tilled again. This is like mm, eight years ago. We didn't have silage tarps doing that. And we slowly, slowly, slowly um, got the rocks out, got the weeds out, and just kept, um, you know, kept working at it. So what, when you're thinking about taking a pasture and turning it into a field for producing food, you need to think about what, what do you have? What equipment do you have? You don't have any equipment? Looks like 43% of you probably have some sort of equipment, whether it's a broad fork and a rake or a tractor, a, B, a BCS. Um, so I have a tractor, I have a plow, I have a tiller, and I don't have a BCS, but I have a tilther, I have a broad fork, and we broad fork everything now. Um, we do, we have taken a lot of hints from JM Fortier, and so I do, um, I, but I also have a category zero, a 22 horsepower tractor, which I think is okay. So here we go. That's the one on the right, and that's my tiller. So uh, tractor is what I had. We've had that tractor since we first moved on this property. Brand new, it was $15,000 in 2006. And the tractor on the left is my friend Jean's tractor. And that is a much bigger tractor. And I use that sometimes over at her place when I prep beds at the beginning of the year. So I was moving compost because I don't have a manure spreader. So I was moving compost with the bucket and then you can, the tiller is on the back and it's uh, not an ideal way to do it, but it's a way that it can be done. So these beds were just uh, left with some cover crop on them over the winter, the deer ate most of the cover crop. And so we came in and just started laying compost. We bought, um, organic compost from Quality Mulch. That's where we get ours. We get uh, about 20 tons at a time on a tractor trailer load. And I just take it by the bucket. I have people spread it out with rakes and then we till it in. And often after we do that, we'll lay a silage tarp. Um, you know, that's kind of a, a basic for what we will do to get started. Um, but back then the pasture with the cows, this just got tilled. And then we just worked it and worked it and worked it over time. Um, I ask common mistakes. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry, I see you're already covering it. Okay, great. I was going to ask about <laughs> the, the noxious weeds because I know that's a and how, yeah. and how to identify them. Yep. Yep. That's and you know I what I I wish I had was some pictures of um, those noxious weeds because that would have been really easy to do. And I'm sorry that I didn't get photographs of those in, but. Um, we definitely have the sheep sorrel and that's the one that has, um, if you know what sorrel looks like, right? It's like the wild sorrel and it has a crazy long tap root. And when you till that and you put those roots into tiny little pieces, then you can fill your entire bed with sheep sorrel. And what I've come to do it with a lot of my sheep sorrel and I've rid my fields of a lot of sheep sorrel is after tilling and after silage tarping, Every year after silage tarping, I go through with a shovel or a broad fork and I pull it up. I take the time to get in there and pull out all the sheep sorrel that I can because you can't grow anything in a bed that has sheep sorrel in it. It sucks the nutrients. So if you're going to give uh, some fertilizer, the sheep sorrel is going to suck it up because the taproot is so big. It takes the water and you just need to get rid of it. So, um, I used to be a teacher in Los Angeles many years ago and in South Central Los Angeles. And I had a 95% Hispanic student population and I was a biology teacher. And 
I hosted the garden club. I wrote a grant to get a greenhouse and we had this little outdoor area. I had a bungalow and we had this wonderful man, Antonio, who would come and volunteer with his tiller and he helped us prep all these beds. And I will remember this to this day and I think it in my head every time I have to spend time pulling weeds by hand. I think of him on his hands and knees while my ninth graders were standing there watching him like he was out of his mind and he would go little by little, weed by weed. And Honestly, that still proves true sometimes when you're farming on a small scale like I do. So get it out. I mean, Johnson grass and Bermuda grass, I'll do the same thing. Not, you can't get it all every time, but that's the beauty of a silage tarp is that when you lay silage tarp down over your field after it's been tilled, you pull up the silage tarp and you can see especially where the grasses are, where the sheep sorrel is. Those are the two that I can really identify and they'll be yellow and coming up, but I can pull them up. So um, silage tarp timing has everything to do with the season, right? Um, it has everything to do. Oh, going back to noxious weeds, I don't spray anything. The, the, there are some organic, again, I'm certified organic. There are some organic sprays. They're so expensive and spraying is so time consuming. Um, I just, I don't do it. We, it, so that's more about um, bed maintenance for us then if we're not going to remove things after the silage tarp comes off. When you prep your beds and plant them, then it's cultivation. Cultivate, cultivate, cultivate. And having sharp tools and having enough tools and having a time every week set aside to cultivate is huge. And it's one of the first things that goes when you get busy and you pay for it dearly. I've paid for it dearly over and over again when I don't take the time to cultivate. So, uh, I would ask you I, a quick question here yeah, about all, yeah. it's kind of a follow up on noxious weeds. Um, I feel like a common mistake that I often see come up is that people um, are itching to grow something and so mm -hmm. they will convert pasture even in the early spring of the year that they plan to um, you know, grow a significant amount. Right. And then yep. of course they end up with fighting, whether it's grass or bindweed or um, thistle because um, it, it's like they've just turned it over. And so they're still mm -hmm. fighting all these perennial weeds. Yep. You had um, like just sort of an ideal system. You didn't need to use that field immediately. Mm -hmm. What would you be your like um, using organic methods with the silage tarp and other tools in your toolbox for converting a field and um, having enough time for it to simmer for you not to be battling so many perennial weeds? Like what would your sequence be? Would you start the fall prior sure. or a whole year yes. prior or how? Fall. I think I would start in fall. I have started in the fall and that works pretty well. Um, starting in the fall, tilling, um, putting a silage tarp on. Ideal, ideal, it would be tilling, putting a silage tarp on for, let's say if you did it in, if you did it in October, leave the silage tarp on for three weeks, pull it off, shape the beds with your rake. So measure them out. What do you want? Do you want 30 inch beds like JM40A? Do you want 42 inch beds? So it works with your tractor and your tiller, you know, 30 inch beds work with the BCS, shape your beds, broad fork, broad fork, broad fork, broad fork and then cover them back up. Pull, pull out what weeds you can see that are obviously terrible. Um, sometimes it's, it's um, what I've done is cover it with a silage tarp, uncover it and till it again. If it's big clumps or there's a lot of weeds or there's a lot of masses of roots and things. Um, because, you know, sometimes I, I, do, I do till. I consider myself low till compared to a lot of people because I'm not, tilling all the time. A lot of fields might not get tilled but once a year at the beginning or the end of the year. Um, I have a half acre, the Wheeler plot, and we went over there and silage tarped a month ago and the other day took the silage tarps off and we're just shaping beds and oh you're gonna see a video of it actually so hold the phone. Um, did that answer your question? Is that, oh, keep going, wait. So then cover it with silage tarps again after I broad fork and, and make my bed. And then wait two weeks, three weeks, pull it off, 
And then I would use my regular bed prep, which would be, if it's already been broad forked, I'm good. Then I would spread my fertilizer based on what I'm going to grow. If I'm growing a brassica, I'm going to put some sulfur and probably some super K based on my soil test if I need potassium. It seems like potassium is something I can put on my crops around here a lot. Um, and brassicas like potassium, they like sulfur. So um, let me back up. With the soil test, do I need lime? Do I need aragonite? So I would have done that after I tilled. If I needed to put lime on, I would till, put my lime on, cover up, and then come back and shape my beds in broad fork. So rake my beds, shape my beds, broad fork, fertilize, tilth, if, if it was to a fine enough uh, if it had been broken down enough. And the tilther, you can see on Johnny's, they have great videos. I have a short video on tilth, on the tilther here, but Johnny's has great tilting videos. They're not cheap, but if you really want to, if you don't have a BCS and you want to go JM40A style, the tilther is awesome. Um, tilth it, and then I'm good to go. I don't direct seed that many seeds. I, I start a lot of stuff transplant. Transplant, transplant, that's how you beat the weed pressure. I transplant beets. I don't transplant carrots, but you know, uh, the lean farm does the lean farm transplants everything. One of my favorite books. Um, this guy is super Ben Hartman. Um, so that's how I would do it. And on a new field that I have now, I'm using landscape fabric too, just because I know the weed pressure is going to be great. So does that answer? Is that suffice? Yeah, I, I think that I think that's that's great. Um, and it's it's sort of like uh, yeah, um, just kind of um, getting a sense of that it can you, you can pay for it with time or with effort. Right. Yeah, know, like yeah. No, um, it's 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 a timely. It's like farming. You can't just start a farm and and just be a great farmer in a year. At least I don't know anybody who has. Everyone, every great farmer I know is started you know, and, and worked their way to where they are. Um, so silage tarp timing, how many weeks or months? Again, in the spring, you need more time. In the middle of the summer, two weeks. You can, and sometimes I can even cover things up in a week if, if like I'm pressed for time and I need those beds. I silage tarp less probably in the summer just because I'm flipping beds. I, so, so I need to be prepped in the spring. Um, removing too soon will weeds germinate? Sure. And even tilting and broad forking after you remove it is going to have weeds are going to germinate. And sometimes weeds just germinate, especially if, if they're not, silage tarp is great for annual weeds for short term, short term silage tarping is great to kill those little thread stage, uh, annual weeds, but they're, they're not going to get rid of your sheep sorrel. You have to get rid of your sheep sorrel. They're not going to get rid of your Bermuda grass. Um, or your, um, I have a terrible one. It's like in the morning glory family. It, I, I don't know if it's bindweed or what it is, but it is rotten. It's worse than sheep sorrel. It's worse. It, it's one of the worst. So, you know, that's just little by little weed by weed. So inefficient or inappropriate tools. Do you need a tractor? You know what? I have always worked with what I've got and I've built slowly. And one of the ways I'm able to make money and make a profit is because I don't buy a bunch of stuff if I don't need it. I don't have a BCS because I'm too cheap, really, to be honest. I have a tractor. So I didn't want to buy a $15,000 BCS. And at some point, if I make enough money, maybe I will move in that direction. But the tractor I have does sometimes cause me to do a little more work in bed prep because my tiller's wider than my beds are and I have to reshape beds. But I work with the tools I have. And... <sighs> I don't get caught up in, oh, look, I made some money this year. Let me spend it all so I don't have to pay any taxes. I, I claim what I have. I had to pay a bunch of taxes this year because I actually made some money last year. And that's the way it goes. I didn't buy a bunch of stuff. Um, so do you need a tractor? Well, let's start with, do you have a tractor? And I think that the BCS tractor model is great. People really like it for the JM40A style farming. Is that what you want to do? Or do you want to do like a Richard Wiswall style farming or a, you know, a bigger style of farming where you're laying plastic and you have the plastic layer and you have the, or you have the cultivator and the disc and everything. And it depends on what you like. 
I am not a big tractor farmer. I, I don't use my tractor that much. I really like to do things by hand. Um, so I think a lot of that's personal choice and you're welcome to ask me at the end, you know, how I do it and what I do more, but um, there's a lot of ways to do it and it doesn't mean that anyone is right. Um, the tools that I think are necessary though for bed prep, landscape rake, the big, big Johnny's landscape rake, which I think I have um, pictures of coming up. Uh, I love for cultivation, I love the cobra head and the scuffle hose. And there's three sizes of scuffle hose that come from Johnny's. You don't have to get them from Johnny's, but um, I love the scuffle hose. I love my broad fork. I have two different kinds of broad forks. Um, so let's see what we got here. If I keep moving post or no tractor, common methods for prep. Um, yep, we do all of that. We flame weed too. I love flame weeding. So that's sort of a stale seed bed um, technique. You don't have to flame weed, but to, to do the stale seed bed technique basically is just to wait for weeds to germinate and then you prep the bed again. You, you either tilt it or you rake it or you flame weed it. Um, but basically doing the stale seed bed technique is about you prep your bed and then you water it or you let the rain come on it. You leave it for a week and then you flame weed or you tilt or you can rake and scuffle hoe, but you do it lightly on the surface and then you plant. Um, an, another way to do like carrots are a tough one, right? So carrots, I plant them and then a week later I flame weed. But before I plant them, I've already silage tarp that area. So I silage tarp, open it up, disturb it as little as possible. So I've already broad forked it. I'll tilth, I seed my carrots, cover them, water them, wait a week, flame weed. And that seems to work pretty well for me. So we've already talked about this. Silage tarp, broad fork, fertilize, rake, tilth, plant. That's the, you know, that's how we roll here. And, and pretty much by the time people have worked for me for a couple of weeks, they know the drill. I have an SOP hanging in the tool shed that does, that gives those steps and says exactly that. So over here, you can see, you can see my pointer, right? You can see my pointer doing this, right? Okay, so here's a cobra head. This is in the upper tunnel too. So these are labeled with blue tape upper tunnel too. So they need to get put back there. And that way they're close to plot four, they're close to both high tunnels. We have a whole other set of these three tools in our tool shed on the other side of our property. Um, here's our landscape rake and here's a little rake. The little rakes are cheaper, hardier rakes, and those need to be used when we're doing pathways or we're first doing beds and shaping so that my, a uh, landscape break doesn't get all bent up, which you can see at the end there, uh, it gets bent up a lot. So we have to fix that. I have two of these as well. Love, love the landscape break. Don't know how I could live. I don't know how I ever lived without it. Um, love my scuffle hose. Broad fork. There's my big broad fork. There's Jenna. That's her first day working for us. <laughs> we put her on the broad fork. <laughs> it was great. Uh, so she was learning how to do it and she did a good job. We, we try to go fairly close, you know, anywhere between, you know, six to 12 inches from broad fork to broad fork. Um, and then you, you know, go away from, so you're stepping on the area of the bed that you haven't yet broad forked. Um, you put it in, you step on it and go side to side and you'll see, you'll see a little video on that. All right. I hope I'm not boring anybody, but it seems like we have so much material to talk about. This is amazing. Um, Thank you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is perfect. This is great. Hey, look. Oh, Hi, no, this everybody. is my hands. Lisa from Oak Spring Farm. We're over here. We've lost sound on your video, I think. Lisa, I think you just went on mute and that's my like, like, the There we go. We moved a silage tarp off of this area. We moved it up here, which you can see behind uh, behind you. You want to show them? Yeah, I'll, I'll get, get it. See I'll it. get it. I can and then, edit. Uh, we're reshaping our beds. We're reshaping our beds. We're broad forking and wheel hoeing right now. So this is an area that we cleared last fall. And 
we we put some cover crop that didn't really do so great and then the chickweed took over and about five weeks ago we laid a silage tarp on it so it's been five weeks it's had a silage tarp on it you can kind of see the shape of the bed but you know over time with water and with everything the beds fall out so you have to reshape them so we're not tilling anything in here and you can see the folks at the back and we've got both broad forks going so um and then over here in this other picture you can just kind of see it's another plot where we have the silage tarp down and silage tarps for those of you who don't use them they're not cheap you know they're like 140 bucks for like a 20 by 100 or 24 by 100 but and, and you got to take care of them because they will rip. You don't want to walk on them. It's, um, but they've, they help me immensely. Can I ask you a quick question? We, oh, sorry. So for silage, yeah. you got two acres in production. Mm -hmm. um, how, like, uh, so how, how much, um, if you were to put it in acreage, do you have in silage tarps, like enough to cover a quarter acre and then you just kind of re rotate them? uh yeah or, that's about right i have five i have five right now but i have two that are on their way out mm -hmm. okay so i bought two new ones this year i think i bought i think i bought two one or two new ones last year mm -hmm. so they they last me about three years so um i have yeah i think i have four or five right now that are in pretty good working condition and i have probably four that are laid down right now and they'll straddle like something like five beds for you or something is that or more more um okay. uh, maybe some, yeah five or six i guess yeah. Yeah. and so one thing to think about i guess for people is also like having blocks which might right. you know because you don't want to use a silage chart on an individual bed that would be super awkward yeah oh i guess you could use landscape fabric but like one of the things just visualizing is that she's working in blocks yes. so that she can rotate out that block and go like that's all going to go in silage tarp now and i'm going to prep those beds for what i need to happen a month from now or whatever yeah and that took time for me to figure that out you know because when i started farming i was bed by bed right you know little by little and the more you work and spend time understanding um you know your crop plan and the more you put into understanding how your soil works and how your farm works and like you know where's the most wind what's the warmest area what gets the most southern light well you know what's going to warm up in the spring earliest and so you know for me i know which plot that is i know which beds i need to have in production first to get early crops so you know and that takes time to learn and it takes time to think you know, it's, it's scaling up. It's been scaling up for me too. But I will warn you, don't buy a silage tarp and cut it into in bed size pieces because I bought, I, I'm like the first person people call when they go out of business, it seems. I'm always that person who shows up on the scene and I just buy stuff from people. And I'm, I, I do it to help them, but I do it because I like to buy things, you know, half price or whatever, 60%, 60 cents on the dollar. But I'm always buying stuff from people that are going, out of, out of business and these guys I know um, were going out of business last year and they had all these specialized tarps made for their beds and I thought that's brilliant but I don't know if that'll really work for me because they were four foot wide and they only had they had 50 foot beds so I bought enough to do a couple of beds four foot wide and 50 feet long so my beds are all 100 feet Mo most all my beds are 100 feet and that's nice too it's good to be consistent I've been working for years to try and get all of my beds to be the same length so that you can reuse strip tape and reuse row covers and you just always know that you need you know 100 foot of landscape fabric so whatever your bed size whether it's 50 feet or 60 feet or 100 feet so i bought these little tarps and they take one four foot by 50 foot takes as many sandbags as um you know one entire side of my 100 foot tarp um, or two sides of my 100 foot tarp. So don't cut it up. Try to make it. Yeah, if you fold it over, fine, but don't cut it up. So, uh, okay, broad forks. This is just the tiniest little that my intern did this. She's very enthusiastic and a great help with videos. So this is an example of a large broad fork. <laughs> there you go. Large broad fork. We have a small broad fork somewhere. There it goes. And this is an example of a much smaller one. So depending on the size of the bed, this one you would have to use 
maybe twice. And this one is gonna take more work, but you won't have to use it twice, but it definitely takes more work. So that big one's from Valley Oak, and we generally, for a 30 inch bed, we can go down once, but it's heavier. So for the smaller people on my farm, uh, it, it takes more effort to really, you know, you have to get on it and move around to really get that in the ground. Um, that's why it's always nice to have at least one person who is nimble and close to 200 pounds on the farm because they can get that broad fork in there. The other little broad fork we use for the high tunnels, especially beds that are next to the walls of the high tunnel, you can't use the, it's, it's difficult to use the big broad fork. So we use a small broad fork and then for the smaller people, they like the smaller broad fork, even if they have to go twice uh, up one side and down the other. So no, how do I, why do I keep doing that? I just want to go this to the next screen. Exactly. All right. Fertility. Whoops. All right. So we use Vermont compost to start our seeds. I do have a nutrient management plan. So we use a lot of compost from quality mulch. And then Fertrell is my supplier of most of my fertility needs. And I use Super K a lot because we have historically had low potassium in our fields. I use Super N because in the spring and with brassicas, which we grow a lot of, they are big nitrogen feeders. Um, Blue N is, you know, Super N and Blue N are fa fairly close. Alfalfa meal is great. It doesn't smell like blood meal and it's cheaper and it's a nice nitrogen source. Uh, gypsum is great. You get sulfur and you get calcium and that's huge for the brassicas and huge for the tomatoes and the peppers. It prevents blossom end rot. I, I use gypsum everywhere. Uh, sulfur I use with potatoes and I use with the brassicas. Lime if I need to bring my pH up. Uh, which we have really acid soil here and we have a lot of um, we have a lot of acid rain. The rainfall is just acidic. Our water is acidic coming out of our well. Uh, blood meal is expensive. I love blood meal as a nitrogen source, but I don't use it very much and it's stinky. I do sprinkle it around my lettuce beds and my uncovered baby greens beds. So the rabbits and the groundhogs get a whiff of it and they're like, eh, no. So, whoops. Um, I do use, I don't fertigate, something I might try this year. Uh, I believe in fertigation. I just haven't bought the equipment and I haven't set it up. I do have a back, uh, gas powered backpack sprayer and I will put the liquid, um, the fish meal, the kelp meal or the fish meal in the backpack sprayer and spray uh, often with BT. So we'll use BT for, um, you know, the cabbage loopers on the brassicas. That is a picture of baby kale, uh, dark abor, I think, which is one of my favorite kale types. Till thing, here we go. Love the tilther. So here's plot four. This is an area that was covered with, um, covered with a tarp. We had just removed the tarp and we're starting to prep beds. So we're prepping beds. We already broad forked and so broad forked and now we're tilting. That's Zaya, my intern this year. Morning. So it's powered by a drill. And you have to make sure you have a big battery. And Jenna's going behind her to pick up the rocks because we are, I've taken out thousands and thousands of pounds of rocks out of that plot over the years. Um, big believer in getting out the big rocks, fist or bigger. Um, so that's the tilther. Again, you can see that on Johnny's. Not cheap. They're not cheap, but I love the tilther. Super helpful. In the tunnel, what's going on here? This is bed prep. Um, Lisa, yeah. sorry. Can I ask a quick question? Somebody, yeah. um, Safan, asked in the chat box if you could talk a little bit more about the specific function of the tilther. Sure. Oh, um, absolutely. And mm -hmm. then I, I have a follow-on question. What would you use if you didn't have a tilther to do what the tilther does? Okay. So I would use what I used to use, because I've only had the tilther for a couple of years, is a rake, is that landscape rake. And so you broad fork and then you rake and then you rake again. Um, so it makes your surface fine. The tilther only goes down an inch or two. And what it's doing is it's working in the fertilizer. So we've just fertilized, right? We've just put, there's my um, fertilizing uh, 
the green thing over here is a nice way to get the fertilizer on your bed. And then we tilt it to mix it in and to give us a really fine seed bed. So it's really, tilting is really important for direct seeding. I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily till, um, actually a lot of times I don't till if we're transplanting. I'll put the fertilizer on and then I'll use my landscape rake, you know? So the tilter is for, we, uh, we put carrots in that bed. So we're tilting, we're making a fine seed bed, um, and then we're putting the carrots in. And it also works nicely. We put salanova and lettuces on landscape fabric. So we will tilt and really shape our bed just right. So you can do it without a tilter. Um, I wouldn't want to use anything that goes any deeper than a tilter. Like I wouldn't want to use like one of those little mini tillers because then you're just stirring up your weed, your weed seed bank too much. Does that answer the question? I think so. And I just wanted to do a quick note. Um, why don't we go through the in the tunnel and in the field slides and then um, take a quick break. Okay, cool. So here's, uh, here's in our tunnel. Which tunnel is this? Tunnel number one. And you can see we have overhead watering system that works fairly well. Um, and Alex is laying drip tape. Oh, he's broad forking. He's really fast at broad forking. And Zaya's raking. Oh, that's in the lower tunnel, actually. Okay, so that's how we do it. In the field, here we go. This is a good one with broad forking. So there's Alex. Alex gets a lot of the heavy work and I'm putting up drip tape. So I am, uh, I like to reuse drip tape. It is not that efficient to reuse drip tape, but I do it because I'm environmentally conscious and uh, I just can't stand to throw it away after one season, but you have to test it and make sure it's good before you lay it under landscape fabric or you just give yourself all kinds of trouble. We had a, another question about um, influences on your decisions to cultivate in the tunnel as opposed to the field. Um, I'm wondering if the person who wrote that question might be able to elaborate a little bit more. Uh, if you're curious about um, what types of bed preparation are happening or, or is this a question about uh, what types of plants? Or yeah. we could answer both. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. Both. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, all right. Frame the question for me one more time, please. Sure. So um, how do you decide what crops you're, how you're doing different types of bed preparation and different types of crops in the field versus the tunnels? Oh, okay. Tunnels are mostly... Over the winter, they're greens because that's um, you know the money maker. I I do uh, attempt to overwinter at least a bed of beets and a few beds of carrots because I need my early market starts in April and this year early CSA. So we've been feeding them beets and carrots along with all the baby spring greens and everybody's really happy. So we carrots, beets, and then greens, and then everything's got to be flipped over by now. And we fill the tunnels with mostly tomatoes, a few rows of peppers and eggplants. And we do have a couple of beds of squash this year in the tunnel. So it's got to be high dollar, hot weather crops that you want to get a jump start on. And bed prep is really the same. I mean, we're broad forking, we're tilting, we're fertilizing. You have to be more careful with the fertilizer and the compost and the high tunnel because things don't break down as much. You can get salt buildup. You can get a phosphorus buildup in your tunnels. Um, but mostly pretty similar, pretty similar. And the crops are, you know, like a half a dozen, I guess, that we put in the high tunnel. Does that answer your question? I think that's great. Um, okay. It's 1150. So why don't we go ahead and take a 10 minute or nine minute break and come back right at noon? Um, now if anybody needs to run to the bathroom, grab a snack, anything like that. And Stretch your legs and we'll get started again in just a couple minutes. Sounds good.
We are back. Um, yep, I think it is noon, so hopefully everybody is back with us, and we're gonna go ahead and get started again. Okay, so just to address the landscape fabric question, we do use landscape fabric here. I use a lot more landscape fabric over at uh, the side-by-side -side property because I don't get over there, you know, out of sight, out of mind. I don't get over there to cultivate and because the weed bank is just got a lot of equity. Um, it's just tough to keep up with the weeds over there. So I, I use a lot of landscape fabric and I bought a bunch of used landscape fabric last year from a farmer who was going out of business and it was cheap. And so I'm using more landscape fabric this year because I have it. Um, and I do really like it. You put the work in on the front side, prepping your bed. You have to prep your bed a little extra careful. And then, you know, you have to use the pins and you have to really get that landscape fabric tight. If you don't get it tight and you're not putting row cover over your crops, the wind gets in there and in those holes and it just sucks all your little seedlings right back under the landscape fabric. We've been battling with that here a lot because I have everybody but one person is new this year. And even though I train them on how to put the landscape fabric down, it's hard to know. It's hard to understand. Like you just don't know how important it is until you see it happen for yourself. And it's, it is tough to learn how to, you know, make it really tight. So we've been spending a lot of time pulling little lettuces and little broccolis out of their holes uh, back to the sunlight and putting lots of rocks, you know, because once the plants are already in the holes, it's hard to tighten the landscape fabric a second time. So um, I like landscape fabric though. It's, and it, it's good from year to year. So it's much better than plastic. I hardly use plastic anymore. We roll plastic by hand. You saw the way my plots are laid out and my beds are laid out. I don't have a lot of space. My 100 foot beds are, um, are tight. So I don't have a plastic layer for my tractor. We roll plastic by hand when we do it. We roll plastic for onions. I really like to put onions on plastic. And sometimes um, things like like broccoli or cauliflower or Brussels sprouts, but now we're using landscape fabric instead. So I hope that answers that question. What was the other question, Sarah? Oh, Actually, bed, bed size. I have right? another quick question about landscape fabric, yep. just really quick while you're on that topic. And that's um, because it heats the soil so much, are there any crops that you don't put into it at certain times of the year? Hmm, okay. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it can be tough on certain crops. That's where, so when I do lay plastic, I usually use white plastic. So when I'm putting in some fall crops in July, I might choose to use white plastic versus landscape fabric. That is a good point um, because the white plastic doesn't take on the heat as much, right? It, it reflects a lot. So that is sometimes um, with more tender crops. So I even, I find though that the black landscape fabric is pretty durable. Like you can put most crops. I put Salanova in that black landscape fabric in July. And as long as I water it, top water it, sprinkler water it every day, it does fine. So um, you might have to water more and keep things cool. I also cover a lot of crops. So most any tender seedling that would be in the brassica family or in the squash family, it's getting covered. So that white agrabond really helps reduce. You end up getting a, at least a 10% reduction in the direct sunlight, oftentimes up to 30%. So using landscape fabric with agrabond is fine. Does that answer? Um, and then bed width. I know there was a question about bed width. Um, I used to try to make all my beds 30 inches. And then I started using some six feet landscape fabric um, with uh you know the jm 40a way and i don't know how that guy puts six feet landscape fabric on a 30 inch bed i haven't figured that one out yet but i end up having those beds wider so i do spend some time reshaping beds and sometimes i have some beds wider than others it's i tr i try to keep them all the same size um but you know sometimes over time some get smaller than others but it's really nice to have a 30 to 40 inch bed because you can reach in from both sides and get to the middle without straining your back. 
and you can just access everything with a scuffle hoe or a cobra head again with using halfway decent um, posture so 30 to 40 inches is generally where they end up um, a lot of my beds are 30 inches okay good move on okay cover crop to cash crop so uh, I do cover crop. I don't use a lot of cover cropping these days um, in between, like in the summer, because we're flipping beds pretty quickly. We're using a lot of compost, um, but I like cover crops over the winter, like oats and winter peas. So Austrian winter peas, oats, which winter kill. I love winter kill oats. I do use some forage radish and some of the best uh, I, I love putting the Kenopod family in early after a winter kill forage radish uh, bed. We grow so many brassicas here though that I don't use as much forage radish as I would like to because it makes me nervous planting so many brassicas all the time on my plots. Um, but I really do like the forage radish. I, I love how it, it winter kills and the leaves make a really nice cover and you can direct seed spinach into it in February and by April you have this beautiful spinach crop. I love oats. Uh, I never seem to get my oats in quite early enough to get a really tall stand of them before the before they winter kill but i really do think it helps add uh, nutrients and it helps with the weeds too because when it dies and covers it can really um, re uh, reduce the weed pressure so those are three i like I, i've used some hairy vetch lately which is in the legume family so i really like um, legume cover crops I don't use things like Sudan grass. I don't, I do use some winter rye, but I will till that in and tarp it because it persists and will just keep coming back. Um, it can be hard to kill, but it's nice to add organic matter. So, um, we have a question. Did you have any challenges this year because there was a lot less winter kill with the warm temperatures? Um, well, I still had uh, winter kill. I do have one plot that's in winter rye right now and I'm letting it grow still. So I think that I'll be able to manage that. But um, I still had some winter kill. I know it wasn't that cold, but the oats all died for the most part. Um, so no, it wasn't too bad. I think pests are what's going to be a problem. I've already seen cabbage loopers in the tunnel. So um, I've already seen flea beetles this year. So pests are going to be a problem because of the mild winter. Um, so cash crop to cash crop, that's what we do a lot of. We do a lot of flipping beds. So I've already had outdoor beds uh, planted. I probably have 30%, 25% of my outdoor beds are already planted in spring greens and turnips and radishes and carrots. And most of those will be done. Some of those will be finished in a month and we'll flip them. Some of these beds will have, uh, could have five cash crops on them this year. So it could go arugula, radishes, well, probably not that, but I would probably go, let's say beets, arugula. So I consider like quick turnaround crops. I don't really worry, which is um, 30 to 60 days or less. Quick turnaround crops like that, I don't get super hung up on crop rotation with. I get hung up on crop rotation here with my kenopods because I get, um, Sclerotinia, or not sclerotinia, I get, um, what is that? I should have written it down. The, um, it's escaping me, but it's when they get the spots on oh, them. Circular, is yeah. it Circospera, maybe? Um, shoot, I know it's, it. It's, um, I'm going to look it up. I know exactly what it is. I just can't pronounce it. Not sclerotinia, it. that's what my lettuce gets, but it's... Cir <laughs> I, I think it's Circospera, I think. Cir that's okay, that's yeah. it. Yes, yeah. You're right, Circospera. Yep, thank you. Yep, you're right. I say, um, Lisa, there was a quick question. I, I, I hate to throw you off here, um, but I just want, uh, a lot of people were asking about your cover crop um, seed source, where you like to buy mm. uh, cover crop seed from. Well, I, I end up buying a lot of stuff from Johnny's and it is more expensive. It's not the best source, but Johnny's seeds just germinate so well for me. Um, I'm in the Young Farmers Coalition, whatever. Yes, they let me in. 
and I get 10% off on all my seeds through them. So I get, or historically Johnny's is always given a 10% discount, which is fabulous. So, uh, but uh, who, I mean, I do get some things from high mowing. Johnny's really is a big seed and Fedco. Fedco has been a good place. I've gotten um, five pound bags of cover crops and things. Sometimes I'll use my local mill. Like honestly with oats, I totally cheap out and I go get a bag of whole oats from the mill for like 20 bucks. Um, horse feed, you know, whole oats totally grow. Um, and I do get, where do I get my Austrian winter peas might come from Nolts. So, you know, I kind of shop around and see, you know, it's hard to get organic. Uh, some of those things. Another reason why I do a lot of Johnny's is because I can get organic from them and I'm tied to buying organic seed because I'm certified organic. So, um, there's excuses sometimes for when you don't have to buy organic seed, but I try to do the right thing and buy it when I can. Okay. Any more questions before I move on? Is that good? Okay. So cash to cash, like I said, and then cash to cover. Well, cash to cover is at the end of the season or actually long before the end of my season is when I have to plant cover crops. So this is where it becomes tricky is really, if I'm organized enough and I understand, you know, the rest of my season planned out well enough, um, can I take that last cash crop? Can I take the squash off in October? And then can I put the oats and the peas in? And, you know, some beds I do that well and other beds I'm like, nah, let me get one more bed of arugula in there. And I grow another bed of arugula and then it's November. And then the only thing left to plan is winter rye. So that's how I end up using winter rye is because I get to the end of the season and I'm sort of, you can't put oats in in November and you can't, you can probably put peas in, but you're not going to get, unless you're going to keep them on in the spring for a little while, it's not going to, you're, it's a waste of money to put oats in late in November, or I mean, uh, peas in. So winter rye becomes a, a choice. So I use a lot of compost because I don't always get a cover crop on every bed. Um, I, I do rotate in buckwheat a little bit when I can in the summer. Um, so that would be if I had a weed problem or a fertility problem, or I really just could give a bed a break. I could put for a month or six weeks, a quick turnover of buckwheat on a couple of beds and add some organic matter and give the bed a, a rest. Uh, seeding. Oh, we're on to seeding. Okay. So I use a Jang. I don't use that Jang. I use the three hopper Jang. Love my Jang. Bought it from a farmer who went out of business and got it for half price. That's how I got it because I wasn't going to pay $1,000 for my three hopper Jang, but I paid $500 for it with a bag of wheels. And um, they, those, the ones I have are, are the only ones I have. So that sort of dominates what I seed with that, but it's great for arugula, spicy mix. I don't use lettuce. I pretty much transplant all my lettuce. Turnips, carrots. Those, I just, I love the jang for that. Um, it really saves seed for me with hackerai turnips and it really saves seed with carrots. And I just get and that's where you have to really have a nice, even, smooth seed bed to use that jang. And then the earthway, the old trusty earthway. I have like five of them or something. I always thought I'd <laughs> put them all together and I never did that. So we just keep one with a radish plate, one with a beet plate, one with a lettuce plate, and then we never have to change the plates out. Um, I use it when I direct seed beets. Uh, when I do, I do usually direct seed beets once or twice a year. I can use it for radishes, definitely use it for radishes. That's probably what I use it for the most. I try to use it for peas, but the peas are tricky. They pop out and they, they get behind the plate and then it sticks. And so I just hand seed. I mean, I, we did 2000 square feet of hand seeded peas and it really doesn't take that long. So, uh, I, but both of those are pretty essential. Um, transplant or direct seed, so yeah. It, it really has so much to do with you. Arugula does not want to be transplanted. It's a crop that's ready in 30 days, right? Um, a lot of the lettuce I plant though, I can get more than one cut on it. Arugula, I'm lucky to get more than one cut. 
I usually maybe cut it twice and then it's done. And, and actually arugula can be a great cover crop. So that arugula, if it gets tilled in and then, and then covered for a little bit of time, it doubles as a, as a cover crop. It can also, it cleans your, can clean your soil too. So even though you cut it, if you're turning in those roots and then letting it sit long enough, it'll add organic matter. Um, seed costs. Woo. Okay. Yes. Yes. There are seed costs, big seed costs at Oak Spring Farm. Uh, I have learned not to try and do things on the cheap. When you spend the labor to prep a bed, when you take the time to get, to use the tilther and to put your fertility, you know, your, your fertilizer down, and then you use old seed or cheap seed or seed that you've never used before and you get 60% germination. Now you've got wasted space in your bed and you're waiting for that crop to be finished and you've, you've lost 40% of what you could have made from that crop. So that's a big reason why I go back to Johnny's time and time again. And I use a lot of the same varieties that I've been using for years. I try 10 to 15% new seeds every year. I try something new. I'm trying this um, Napa cabbage, Merlot Napa cabbage this year. I'm trying uh, that's new and kind of fun. And I'm trying a couple of new bean varieties this year. Um, but a couple, maybe a couple new lettuces, but for the most part, I'm using a lot of the tried and true. Um, and we transplant, transplant, transplant because it beats the weeds and you just have control over your, you have control over filling that bed. If I transplant a bed <clears throat> with bok choy, one, I'm getting exactly the spacing I need. Two, I'm beating the, the weeds and the flea beetles by uh, two or three weeks. And I know that I have, I know that however many heads I plant is pretty much how many heads I have for my estimate for my CSA in four weeks. So it just, it gives me more control. And it, it just, it makes sense for us. Same with beets. Beets are a nightmare to weed, to, to thin, right? And when you use the beet plate, I know that, um, I know Jack, my mentor covers, he uses the earth weight and the beet plate and he covers every other one with tape. And that's working really well for him. So I'm going to try that when I do my direct seed beets this year. But other than that, transplanting them, I get a really nice stand of beets. And I don't have to thin them, but maybe once for a short amount of time. Um, yeah, the Jang is expensive. But now that I know the Jang and I have it, I would pay full price for it. But I wasn't willing to pay full price for it before I had one and I knew how good it was. So... I could see myself buying another Jang before I would buy another Earthway because I really do save seed and it really is easier and it makes you prep your bed better. And the more time you spend beforehand, the better your crop is going to be. The more time you spend on it, the better it's going to be. So the whole idea of throwing a bunch of seeds in and walking away, you know, that's not farming. It's, um, you know, winging a prayer, <laughs> winging a prayer farming. And I, so seeding for transplants. So we seed by hand. We do everything by hand. There's my two tunnels. There's my one with the uh, propane heater. That's my newest tunnel. I got both of those with the equip grant. Um, I probably, I think this one was $12,000, almost $13,000 because I had somebody put it up for me. I didn't do it myself. I helped, but I didn't do it myself. And I think they covered um, 8,000 of it or something, seven or 8,000, the equip grant covered. And this one probably only cost me 8,000. I think the equip grant probably paid for 6,000 of it or something. So pretty good, pretty helpful. Um, Oh, here's a video. So inside of the tunnels, we have an SOP for seeding trays. And this just gives you a brief outline of how to identify how many seeds need to go in each cell and based on the different tray sizes and based on the different types of variety of seeds. So that's hanging in the high tunnel. Of course, if anyone ever has a question, they just call me. I'm like, we have an SOP on that. They're like, oh yeah, right, I forgot about that. So it's really great to make um, standard operating procedures. <laughs> if only you know them, it's really great to make them. Always helpful. <laughs> if only you use them. 
<laughs> um, oh wait, I don't want to do that. How do I, why do I do that? All right. So, here, oh, here's another video. Each of these little holes is called a cell. This particular tray has about 128 cells. So that, so we use, we use 72s, which are the six packs. They break apart into six packs. We use 128s, which is, that's what Zaya was saying, that not about 128, there are 128 cells in that tray. And then we use some 200 trays and they have 200 cells in them. And they're written on at the, at the front end of that tray. You can see it. 200s are pretty tight. When we get busy around here, I have a tendency of putting off transplanting over direct seeding. And sometimes if they're in 200s, my plants can get a little root bound and they don't like that. I, I do. Um, I'm a little bit famous for it sometimes of doing that, but uh, 128s, 200s are nice if you know you need a quick turnaround because you're using less soil and that plant is going to be ready faster. 128s are like a standard for me with all my brassicas and my lettuces, most of my lettuces um, and anything, I, I can even put squash in 128 and then I'll pot it up into a 50. I do it with tomatoes too. I'll start tomatoes in 128 and then I'll pot them up into 50 trays so that they're just big enough to transplant. And again, it saves soil. It's all about soil. I use really good soil, whether I'm using Vermont compost or uh, um, uh, McEnroe. I just got a pallet delivered of McEnroe and you know, it's almost $15 a bag and it's great, but I don't wanna waste it. So I don't wanna pot things up in great big pots. I wanna use small pots and then get them in the ground and have a quick turnover. Uh, so in seeding, um, most everything is going to be one to two seeds. And I say one to two, and this is because I have a staff of people, three people, sometimes volunteers seed. I don't want anyone going back and trying to dig out a seed if they've put, if they know there's only supposed to be one, I don't want anyone to spend a bunch of time. Now the vacuum seeder is beautiful and it's an expense I have not incurred yet. And, um, you know, at some point I could see that a vacuum seeder would be something, you know, a precision seeder is something that I may ramp up to. But for now, we do it all by hand. And we also use the little Johnny's uh, green seeder. We do that. And then we just seed from the seed packet. But a lot of things are one to two seeds. And if you have two, you can thin it. Or sometimes you can, you know, prick it out and put it into an empty cell. Here we have the lovely Jenna a seeding squash inside of a 72 tray cell. So I like to start squash usually in 72s just because they need more room. But, um, and we have this table that is here is uh, like a seeding table. So you can dump a bag of soil on it, have your tray there, and then quickly just fill up trays. And that's pretty handy. Here we oh, have nope. the lovely. Let's try this. Oh, another video. Here you have an example of a 50 tray cell. There you go. So now you've seen all, all of them. Maybe not the 200, but the 50s are great for cantaloupe and squash as well. Um, and there's the cedar. In some cases, you may have seeds that are really small and you don't necessarily feel as comfortable picking them up in your hand. So you may use something like this which allows you to rotate the size. And it helps to prevent too many cells coming out at one time, which could cause overcrowding and then causing you to have to go back and thin out your plants. <laughs> so we do, I encourage new people to use that, right? And there's dials. So zero through five is the size of the hole the seed comes out. I'm sure most all of you are familiar with this. We also use just the seed packet, but something that's really important that a lot of people that I have to remember, and it's in the SOP, do not put seeds back in the packet once your hand has touched it. You have moisture, you have oils on your hands, and if you're wanting to save seeds, sometimes I buy tomato seeds in like a 500 pack, and I wanna keep some tomatoes for the next year. And as long as I only take out what I need, 
and I put that package back in a cool, dark place, which I usually keep them in like Rubbermaid containers and I keep them in my office um, throughout the year. So it's a consistent temperature. You can, you can use seeds for the second year in a row uh, if, if you know they've been stored properly. So um, it's a big no-no around here to dump seeds back in the packet when you're done with them because you, you have put something on those seeds that can potentially um, spoil the rest of your seeds. Not spoil, but the moisture is going to cause the seed to have a shorter shelf life. You have a question here um, about, let's see, a couple questions. Um, first one will be uh, if you have ever used soil blocking and if you have, how do you feel like that compares with using the cell trays? I think soil blocking is a beautiful thing. I don't do it because I started out using plastic trays and now I have an arsenal of plastic trays. I do wash them out and reuse them. And um, I have a couple of farmer friends. When I met Elliot Coleman, when I went to the, um, when I went to the conference up in New York, um, Stone Barns conference, I chatted with him and his daughter about the soil blocking because they're huge proponents of soil blocking. And they explained it all to me. They showed it to me. I was looking at all their stuff. Their, their transplants are beautiful. They're much healthier than transplants I grow. And, and Tamara of Wild Peace Farm, who is not farming this year, but she did soil blocking. And so I had the chance to buy all that stuff last year and I came close, but I, I do think it's really good. I just am a little bit, I guess, of, of an old dog and didn't want to start up something new. Um, I make the trays work pretty well, but I think if you are motivated to do the soil blocking, do it because the transplants I've seen from soil blocking are, are beautiful. I think it gives the cell, you know, you have the, the root system is better, more adaptable when you transplant it. And it doesn't have the tendency of getting of getting caught up in that small plastic cell. So I would do it if uh, I was more motivated. Great. And we did have one other question about uh, what Vermont compost product are you using for the um, for your soil? McV, I think, is what it's called. Cool. Something with a V in it. Mm -hmm. uh, Fort V, maybe. Yeah, Fort V. Thank you, Fort V. Yeah, and then the McEnroe is the light. It's called something light that I use, but it's not easy to find McEnroe around here. But it's a really nice product. Oh, so, great. hey, we're at the resources page. Um, this is just some of the resources that I use and like, and some of the books that I've read. And that's I I love I love the Lean Farm stuff. I think Ben Hartman is a genius and just really enjoy reading what he has to say. And I agree with almost everything he does, except transplanting carrots. I just can't transplant carrots. But good for him that he does it. It's great. Does he use the paper pot transplanter? Yeah. And that's how he does the carrots? That's, I heard that folks can transplant anything with that because you get zero root disturbance. Right. I don't know exactly that he uses it with the carrots. He probably does, but I know he uses it. I know he uses the paper pot transplanter. Okay. So that's pretty neat. Um, yeah. I think that's all the slides we have, right? Oh, and that, so yeah, if you, if people have questions or if they, you know, want to hear more about a particular thing of how we do it, I'm happy to stay on and answer a bunch of questions. Great. Thank you so much. So before anybody leaves, um, we are going to have time for questions, but I'm also launching our final poll, which is our post-event survey. So I'm asking everybody to please fill that out if you don't mind. It's just a few questions and it gives us really important information on how we do with these presentations and what you want to see in the future. Um, you can also write uh, directly to me or in the chat box if you have ideas for, um, for future webinars and field days and things like that. All right. Um, going back to the uh, oh, and one more thing. I, I put at the beginning of the chat the Future Harvest Resources page for COVID-19 and some other things. I'm going to put that back in the chat again, and, and we'll send a follow-up email with that information as well. Um, and if you go to the Future Harvest webpage, you'll also see the Resources tab. If you go down through that, um, you'll see past webinar recordings. We will be uploading this one, um, and it's not a member benefit yet, but at some point in the future, these might be member only. So if you're not yet a Future Harvest member, do consider 
signing up for membership. All right, Lisa, back to you. Um, we have a question about severe winds and wind barriers. Has wind been anything that you've had to deal with? Or do you want to go through actually your, um, your plant sale and, and markets and how folks can actually get in touch with you in the future? Sure, I guess so. Um, a way to find out what's going on here is we have a newsletter that you can sign up for on our website and that usually we put out a newsletter monthly just saying if there's events at the farm or what's happening around the farm, um, you know, if anybody's up in this area, we will be going to the Hereford Market that is opening on time the second Saturday of May. Um, we do have a plant sale coming up. So that's on May 2nd. I'm mostly doing pre-orders and you can find the information for that on Facebook or on uh, if you sign up for our newsletter. Um, and then we're on Facebook and Instagram, which we do post, uh, in our, like, we post a lot of pictures just so you can see, you know, we definitely have bed prep stuff in there and we have, we put a lot of pictures on of just what we're doing around the farm. Um, and I do use Harvey and if anyone has any questions about Harvey, or if you're curious about using a new CSA platform, uh, I really, it, it there was a learning curve and it's not cheap but I am so grateful that I had signed up with Harvey last year and I learned how to use it. It really helped me quickly pivot uh, to get this, you know, April CSA up and running. And um, it really, it, it's a customizable CSA so people can get exactly what they want. It's really easy to put add-ons. So I'm also selling beef and lamb products from a neighboring farm. I'm selling somebody's honey. I sell some uh, flower farmers bouquets. I'm now selling um, some bedding plants and hanging baskets um, from another neighbor. So I'm selling cheese and butter from another farm. So it's really nice uh, to, to put add-ons. So yeah, so that's about it. You know, you can reach out to me. I am so busy right now. I'm terrible about getting back to really any form of communication. But if you really have a burning question for me about this presentation, feel free to, to email me. It just might take a minute to get back to you. Uh, we had a question about your plant sale. Um, are you gonna have wholesale plants available as well as um, individual ones for the general public? Or I don't have anything wholesale right now. I will see what happens after we do the retail portion of the plant sale. And if I have leftovers or like trays of things, um, I am trying to ramp up my production as much as possible so I can have some extra stuff for farmers who are in need because I realize that that is, um, you know, there's a need for that in this area. We need a wholesaler of certified organic plant starts because mm -hmm. Banner Greenhouse is grateful as I am to have them. My stuff always shows up upside down and sideways and 20% of my plants that I've just paid a premium for are laying all over the box. And you know, we need somebody around here. So any of you that aren't quite sure what you're going to do with your farm yet, please be a wholesale organic transplant person. Because I'll note that um, Jay Martin, who used to grow certified organic transplant back in the day and provided like Jack and Becky Gurley and is uh, now transitioning back, I think, um, into starting his nursery business back up. He's on the Eastern Shore. I believe he did grow certified organic transplants. I'm not sure if he's yet in the place where they're gonna be certified organic, but hopefully that will pick up and we'll keep you all apprised of that. He's a trainer in the program uh, in the BFTP as, as well, but yes, much much needed a certified yes. grower in the area, yeah. A couple more questions mm -hmm. here. Um, Let's see. Oh my goodness, they're coming faster than I can. I have, some, I have some pulled back. Do you want me to jump yeah, in? Yeah, go for it. So, okay. um, one pre uh, let me see if we can um, group some of these together. Okay, so um, one question is about um, deer pressure. Th these are a little, they're like now we're getting into like the questions. Okay, kind of yeah. Of so, no, yeah. I know. <laughs> I know that's how it goes. Um, so deer pressure, absolutely. And wind, someone asked me about wind. I'm sorry, I didn't answer that. So we're pretty lucky around here because in, I don't know if you could see in that first little video, but we have a lot of arborvitae trees that surround our property. And then I have barns and I have tunnels and we have, there's cornfields on two sides of us, but we have a barrier. We have trees as a barrier. Um, so we do have a lot of protection compared to 
for instance, the side by side plot where I farm, which is really wide open. And we use um, a lot of row covers. You need a sandbag like every foot at, at, you know, when you're dealing with a high wind area and then you still have to fix them every day. What a time suck it can be, but it's, you know, row cover and sandbags is one of the only ways to be able to get stuff in early and protect it from the wind. When you have these young little transplants, even when they're well hardened off, you've got to protect them for a while or they just get beaten up so badly. You know, their roots can't do their job and they can't, um, you know, they, they can't, they can't get rooted in. So we cover almost everything that we put in right away. We cover onions, we cover all our brassicas. I even cover lettuce this time of year because of the wind and the cold at night. Um, so you don't have to cover lettuce at this point in the season, but uh, generally, because it can take a frost. Um, but I cover a lot of stuff. So the wind is tough. The deer are tough too. I have a big deer fence that I put up a couple of years ago. Um, we have a three board fence because we used to have the cows and the horses. So we have a three board fence around a lot of my growing area. And then we put up an eight foot deer fence with bamboo poles, uh, you know, just zip tied to bamboo poles and put up and, and that takes maintenance. Uh, with the mul rose multiflora growing up it and pulling it down and um, all the rotten invasive bushes that like to grow in there and knock the fence down. But um, we use electric deer fence, double layer, um, meaning in width. So two sets of poles and two sets of tape and we bait it with peanut butter and we put deer fence up everywhere pretty much because if we don't deer just wreck stuff i've had a groundhog take out 200 heads of lettuce overnight i've had deer wreck just trash a bed of squash a, a you know corn they love corn they just wreck everything deer can be really um and it took me years to really take it seriously to fence them out and keep them out i had to go through a lot of crop damage before um, I really ramped up my defenses and it takes money and it takes time, it takes labor. So it's not going to go away. They're getting worse here. Does that answer all those questions? Yeah, I think, um, do, 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 do. okay. So I, uh, okay, let me see. Uh, but da, 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 da. okay. So grouping together some questions about, um, about income somebody asked when you calculate oh when you calculate net income i assume that this is um not including your mortgage but somebody asked do, when you calculate your net income is that after paying your mortgage um so yeah my mortgage is paid about half by the farm so what um so how i started out when i first had to support myself i started out by paying the mortgage all out of my own personal account and i paid myself i paid myself four thousand dollars a month and my mortgage is over two thousand dollars a month so i did manage because my phone is paid by the farm and part of my electricity bill is paid by the farm part of my all my bills are paid by the farm and my grocery bill is pretty low because we eat a lot of farm food we have eggs and then i i just buy a lot of food and barter for a lot of food so i have a pretty low like you know grocery store bill um and now because i have a commercial loan with farm credit i came to understand that i could put my mortgage in my farm expenses and so what so now the farm covers my mortgage and then I have to take some of it back at the end of the year, if that makes sense, like in my personal income or in my, like as an expense, some of that expense has to be put on as um, my income. So last year I did it that way. And actually my income <laughs> was much higher last year than it was the year before one, because I didn't buy a lot of stuff. And so that's why I had to pay a bunch of taxes last year. But so um, that net 40 last year was what the farm made, the farm made $40,000. And that was not including my, most of my salary, but that's not normal. A how the accountant looks at it is what the farm makes is my income. But my income ranges between forty and forty and fifty thousand dollars a year. That's what I pay myself. That's what I've been paying myself for the last three years. That's so great. I just want to like take a moment to like pause and say what a feat 
that is and um, like just how, I mean, I think it's hard, especially for people who haven't been in the farming world a while, who are just getting into kind of really fully appreciate um, what skill and determination and savvy um, it really requires to be able to pull those numbers, um, especially on two acres of production and doing things on the fly without necessarily having all of the equipment that you would ideally want. Like that is, I mean, just kudos um, for that. It's knowing your market and it's not being afraid to charge the prices that you know you deserve. When I started out, I, I couldn't, you know, sometimes people will say like, well, that's a lot of money. I'm like, well, I need to make a living. And you know what, when you're supporting three kids, $40,000 isn't that much money. I mean, it, it's, it's good you, you, for farming. It's great. I'm not saying that I don't, I make plenty of money. Like I feel very comfortable with the money I make, especially because the business does pay for a lot of my expenses, but you know, kids, three kids, man, they can, especially when they're all home right now, they can eat a lot of food and <laughs> stop you eating. Know, <laughs> you know, teenage boy eat. It's impressive. <laughs> so and the clothes, you know, no. So it's, but it, no, I'm very grateful. And, you know, I, I did get a grant right when my marriage fell apart and I knew I had to figure it out. You know, I had a grant that helped me and floated me and I wouldn't have made it without the grant. I wouldn't have made it without my friends and family who loaned me money and who came and just helped. I have so many people to thank for, you know, getting to where I am. And right now because of because we advertise that's another thing farmers have a hard time advertising and farmers have a hard time when i when i first started farming i used to feel like well i grow this great food you should just come buy it i shouldn't have to sell it to you i shouldn't have to work this hard to advertise and convince you to buy my food like this is so much better than anything you can get at the grocery store it doesn't work that way i've learned to really be grateful for my csa members and really be grateful for my market customers and understand that it's them they're the reason that i get to do what i do and um the, the your true customer understands that um, if they want to eat nutrient dense, healthy food that supports their health and the local economy, that they're going to pay for it. And a lot of people think, well, I can't afford that, but not all my customers are high end customers. I have a lot of CSA members and a lot of customers who make the same amount of money per year that I make, you know, that, that they just, they take their health seriously and they take the health of the local economy seriously and community. It's about being in community. You know, farmers markets and CSA is about community and community building and, you know, being in this together. And I know everyone's saying that about COVID-19 right now, but that's really what the local, you know, a, lo a strong local economy is about, you know, being, being in it long-term together. So, that's how I'm able to make a living is for all the people that understand that I'm an important part of the local economy and I'm an important part of the local community. And they appreciate that they can, you know, that they can trust where their food's coming from and they can bring their kids to the farm and see the chickens and they can see where things grow and they can get a farm tour. And so, you know, it's a real, um, you know, you and your customers, are like this and and we're all a network farmers are really good at networking and and standing up for each other and sticking it together so i'm very happy to be part of this community can i ask you because i don't see any i, I don't think there's any like um more of like super detailed questions can i ask you like a few just kind of like stepping back big picture sure jen since we have you for 15 <laughs> more minutes just, fire away okay so this is a weird time to be a uh, aspiring farmer just getting into this this is a really super weird year to do that mm -hmm. um like maybe you came into this last fall maybe some of you who are in the bftp going like oh yeah i'm gonna jump into farming next year what would your advice be to people who are just starting out now in this very weird season hmm be careful. Um, I, I've had people come out of the woodwork wanting to buy food from Oak Spring Farm. Here. Quick, quick question, Lisa, do you mind if we stop the screen share so we can see um, your face as you talk? Oh, yeah, sure. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. 
I got to figure out how to do that. Stop uh, sharing. I can. Got it. There you <laughs> go. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. So can you see me now? So I've had people come out of the woodwork wanting to join the CSA. I mean, I've increased my CSA this year by 50% and it's almost full and it's making me a little nervous. I had an April CSA that we've never done before, which was filled. I offered it to my members first. And after my members, my current members joined, it was full in 10 days and the May shares were full 10 days ago. Um, so pe people, it's unprecedented how people, when this first happened, people were calling me and emailing me and putting in orders and coming to the farm, people that have never bought from me before, who suddenly, you know, I raise pastured broilers, mostly for my family. And I offer my CSA members chicken when they want it. I raised 60 last year. I probably sold 10 last summer. So I had 50 in the freezer and I thought that's enough for my family. Maybe I don't even have to raise broilers this year. I'll just, you know, go through. They're all gone. Sold every last five twenty-five a pound for a pasture-raised bird that's been fed non-GMO feed, and I've got four left in my freezer. Um, I bought a quarter of a cow from my neighbors at Shady Spring Farm. I was selling left and right. I'm out of ground beef. I sold every last pound of ground beef that I had. Um, you know, eggs. I can't keep up with the eggs. So. And the vegetables I'm selling, everything I can harvest right now. So I think as a new farmer, it'll, it'll probably feel really good because it'll feel like, hey, everybody wants your stuff. But I think it's a funny year and not to base next year's sales on this year's sales, but take what you can get and develop relationships with those people that are buying from you now, because that is how you are going to get that's how you're going to make it in farming is to remember that the relationship you really need is yes, you need a relationship with the land and other farmers, but you need a relationship with your customers. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know how to do that, or if you haven't started that, that is, that is how you make money. That is how you get to keep doing what you want to do. So what you need to do is take steps to create relationships with those people to, so that they'll keep coming back next year that you create them, you know, you create a local, a desire to buy local food long after the pandemic is over. That, that's amazing. Um, and then a few, a few more questions have come in and I'll sort of maybe frame this one as like, so I think that was like a really beautiful, um, take on how you both appreciate the peculiarity of this moment, but also it's kind of what farmers are doing all the time, which is shifting in response to the changes that are happening, whether they're climate change induced or COVID induced or market changes that are happening more broadly. Um, so there was a question here also about like this weird cold spring that we're having um, and how you've adjusted, but I'd love if you also address that on just kind of like how do you build in enough flexibility into your systems, into your crop plan, whatever, in general, to adjust for, uh, you know, fluctuations in, let's just say, uh, that are kind of weather, um, like, based on the, the, the weirdness of the, the weather? How do you generally approach that? I'm a bit of a hustler. Like, I can, I can move things when I need to move things, and I can bring in things when I need to bring in things. Like, I'm, this is a very dynamic business. Being a small business owner is very dynamic. Um, and I'm, this, this profession, you know, I'm made for this profession, I think, because it's wearing a lot of hats, and it's juggling, and, you know, rarely is it, unless you're a working for me full time, do you really, can you really see the clear ADHD tendencies that I have? Sitting at a desk was never for me and being focused on one task for a long period of time is not good for me. So, you know, I, even though I jump around a lot and I forget stuff or I don't, I'm not always organized, only the most organized people that work for me get driven a little crazy by it. And they usually hold it in and about after a couple of months of working here, they go, I can't take it. <laughs> they say it really nicely. They're like, I've never seen anyone work so hard, but if you were just a little more organized, oh, it'd be so many things would be easier. And I'm like, yeah, I know. You know, it is what it is. <laughs> Doing the best I can. So, um, you know, it <laughs> sorry, that was a little bit of a tangent, but um, I love it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that doesn't really answer that question at all. Um, 
you're gonna no, I think that, yeah it's the hustling that and i know yeah. from having observed yeah, you and other girls yeah that to have like um to appreciate how much hustle it's going to take and to sort of uh weirdly kind of cultivate it even though it might be discouraged in like desk jobs that ability, yeah. right yeah. no I, and i do right so like i'm what i'm learning to do this year is to be more of an aggregator a little bit more of an aggregator right so right now on my site because people don't want to go to the grocery store like i said i'm offering meat i was offering my chickens i'm offering the neighbors beef i'm like what else you got they're like we have beef sticks let me have some beef sticks you know, you know, I'm like the cheese people. I'm like, what else you got? And they're like, well, we have some butter. I'm like, give me the butter. And, you know, I'm just like at apples. I'm getting apples from Three Springs Fruit Farm. I'm getting potatoes from Peter Seawick, who has certified organic potato. Actually, he just sold out and kind of heartbroken because my people have been buying, buying them up. And I'm just like, you know what? It's okay. We've increased our CSA. And this year I'm going to say, look, if I run short on food, people, I'm going to buy it from trusted farmers. I'm not going to be sneaky. Transparency is one of my core values. I'm not going to be sneaky. I'm not going to go to the auction. You're not going to, you're not going to wonder where this stuff came from. I'm going to say, look, I'm getting this from Peter Seawick. I'm getting this from Good Dog Farm. I'm getting, you know, if anyone has anything extra, that's what I'm a little bit worried about is that, you know, it might be harder to, to aggregate. But I think just I also have a three tiers, three tiers of sales here. I have the CSA primary, I have markets, which I added a market this year before this whole COVID thing started. So three markets and then restaurant sales and the restaurant sales uh, will come back at some point, but for this year it's, it's CSA and it's markets. Um, and my one market isn't opening, but I've already made up for it at least for the spring with the CSA. So being flexible and knowing when to pivot, right? This was the COVID was all about the pivot. And so just being flexible, I don't think that um, how I farm certainly isn't for a rigid personality. You know, I'm a water sign, I've got the flow. And <laughs> I, can, I can be very fluid with things. And, you know, sometimes again, that's what drives people nuts, but it works, uh, it, it, mostly. I mean, I'm doing it. So might not be the best way to do it and might not be the prettiest way to do it, but I'm doing it. So again, everybody's different, you know, and I've picked up things from a lot of different people, a lot of different farmers. I've read a lot of books. I wish I had more time to go visit other people's farms because I learned so much every time I step foot on somebody's farm. And it could be somebody who's only been farming for a year. The people that go out of business that I buy stuff from, I learn from them. I'm like, how did you use this? What did you do? can I, you know, can you explain this to me? And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Or geez, that's a great tip. <clears throat> I'm always willing to learn and I'm always learning. So, I mean, I think that's part of being good at life, but certainly helps being a, a farmer. So on, on this question of being uh, good at life or trying to get better at life, right? <laughs> While we have you for seven more minutes, tell us how to be good at life, Lisa. Um, because somebody did ask, I, I'm, I'm entirely serious, actually, I'm not joking. Somebody asked in the chat box, um, whether you experience any stigma as a single woman farmer. And I feel like that really goes to the heart of like, how do you balance everything that you balance? You've got like three kids, presumably at home right now, not going to school. Oh no, they are at home. Oh, they're fully at home, just trying to eat everything that's <laughs> no edible. About it. Yeah, like I mean, but just in, I mean, it goes to this whole like hustling thing too. But um, how? I don't, you know, sage wisdom for us in your party. I don't, know. I don't know if I have any sage wisdom, but <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I'm not always the prettiest farmer. I'm not always the prettiest mom, but um, you know, I am a free range parent to the core and you know, I just go with the flow. I, I totally trust that, you know, your words become things and you speak, whether it's allowed or in your head of what you need and you think of how, you know, you trust that what you need will come to you. And it is amazing to me sometimes how I'll be thinking about something or I know I'm in need of something and somebody out of the blue will be like, Hey, do you need a, like, whatever, like I'm, I'm, I have water tanks and I'm increasing my water tanks. And I, my neighbor who works in wastewater treatment this year, he's like, Hey, you know, I was thinking we could just get a pump and we could hook up and, and, da, 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 da. and he just started doing it. Like we have this amazing water system now that, because, and, and he bought the pump. He's like, this is an experiment. I'm going to do this because, um, I need to learn how to do this. Cause maybe this will be a new income stream for me. I'm like, okay, great. 
you know? So it, it's really, uh, I mean, that's just one small example, volunteers, right? Some people, they can't stand to have volunteers around because they can be a pain in the butt, right? And they just, and they can be time sucks. It's same with interns and apprentices, right? Sometimes it's just a time suck, but I kind of like the customer. I've learned to embrace that everybody is giving me something that I need and I'm giving them something they need, right? So when the volunteers come, the more generous I can be and the kinder I can be and more open, I always get more from them than they get from me. That's how I feel. And they feel the same way. They feel like they get more from me. I give them food. I give them knowledge. You know, we get, they get an education and they've weeded a carrot bed or they've planted a row of something. So, you know, my sage wisdom is to just try to be positive and trust, just trust. I, <laughs> I went through hell. I went through the divorce from hell a few years ago and whew, and it wasn't his fault. What it wasn't, it was his fault. It was my fault. I mean, we, I have a part, he has a part. The kids did not have a part, but the kids felt like it was their fault. And, and we were both, you know, just wrecks and the kids went through it. And, you know, I just have to trust that this is their life too, right? This is their path. And we all, we all are here because we're supposed to be. That is a big one for me is I just trust that everything is happening the way it is because it's supposed to. And I can't sit around and think about why it's happening the way it is or, oh, poor me or, oh, God, this sucks. But, um, you know, I just have to trust that this too shall pass and this is all for a higher purpose. You know, so, um, very personal. We, my husband and I, our third baby died and that felt like the end of the world. And then we had a fourth. And. Isabel, who I wish she was here today. She's set in the world on fire and she, she is fire. I mean, that girl is meant to be here and you know why it wasn't meant to be here. So it's like, that was a huge tragedy in my life as was the divorce, but it taught me, you just have to trust that it all happens the way it's supposed to. You don't get to know why you just roll with it and you just do the best you can and if you take, if you feel like you're taking too much sometimes, just give it back or pay it forward. And you just keep rolling. It's so amazing. I feel like it's, um, yeah, like I've learned so much, like just kind of knowing you through the years as well, like just this, um, this basic uh, lesson of acceptance that, that strangely spans things from like imperfections in bed preparation <laughs> to like the deepest things that happened to us in life too, just kind of like, you know, it's uh, like the good and the bad of farming is like it's different every year as is life and it's messy and you don't have all the tools or the things that you wanted, but just like, um, yeah, it's something I really admire um, and, you know, about you is like this acceptance, but also moving the ball forward down the field, kind of doing all those things um, at, at once. And, um, I guess maybe we would, uh, yeah, people are crying. <laughs> we did, yeah, people are crying in the chat box. <laughs> you didn't think that you signed up for a webinar on bed preparation, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, I, wa I wonder if we might close on like, you know, people are now like, how do I intern at Oak Spring? Um, <laughs> like, and, so, I'll tell you what, yeah. I have an amazing crew this year. I yeah. am so so thankful and so grateful because Sarah, I know, you know, that I'm not always the easiest boss and I can, I, I, can, I actually have heard quite the contrary, but oh, sure. really? Okay. Yeah, no, I've heard it. I can be, I can be hard on people because I work really hard and sometimes I work too hard. You know, I have to really rein myself in sometimes. And I have those kids. My 10 year old sometimes is like, why are you always working? And I'm like, you know what? If I had a job teaching and I was gone 10 hours a day, I wouldn't be here to get you off the bus and put you on the bus. And I wouldn't be here, you know, so it's a juggle. It, it is a juggle and something that I have learned. I've, you know, I've learned that I have to take the time, but I do work a lot, it, it, especially when your job is at your house, you know, it's right out my door. Like at our nine minute break, I ran out, I watered three trays. I switched off the, I, I turned the pump off. I turned the drip tape off that I've been watering the tomatoes for an hour, you know, went to the bathroom, got a drink of water. I'm like, okay, got it. Seven and a half minutes. Best seven and a half minutes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but um, I have a great, great crew and I've started, um, so I'm getting to be a better boss to have done. I took my, we did an employee retreat this year 
And I took my folks to a mansion overnight and we played games and we made dinner. We made this amazing dinner and we had drinks and we had a beautiful breakfast that we all made and we all just got to know each other. And it's the best thing I've ever done for my employees. And now like they hang out, like my, they finished work yesterday at four and the guy who finished at four, his girlfriend showed up with homemade dandelion wine and my whole crew's hanging out on the back of the pickup truck having dandelion wine. And I'm like, don't you people have something better to do? Oh no, it's COVID. <laughs> There's nowhere to go. <laughs> but you know, it's nice. Like I really feel like they appreciate their jobs. I appreciate them. And um, you know, the interns work. They don't work as hard as some farms, I guess. You know, people have told me, but they they work pretty hard. And I expect a lot from my people because I expect a lot from myself. So um, and you know, it gets pretty busy. It can get pretty tense here, but. I need, um, I need a letter of recommendation from a farm that you've already worked on. My apprentices need ideally to have had a year of experience now. Um, I, I have that position where I'm in that position where I can have my interns and apprentices have a year of experience and they need a letter of recommendation. Someone needs to tell me why I should hire them. And um, I got some, I, I, I had 10 amazing letters of recommendation and people that were like, top candidates that I was really hard to, to take down to two people. Um, it was really tough. And then I have one girl who's worked for me for three years, um, Kat. So she left for a year, started her own farm and came back and said, that was really hard. <laughs> Can I have my job back? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, she came back with some gratitude and that was, that felt good. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's good. I have a good crew. And so I would just say anyone who wants to intern here, start early, send me those letters in January, send me your resume. And then, you know, just get in front of my face. Zaya, who was doing the videos, she called me and was just like, so dynamic on the phone. I had almost made my decisions and I was done. And she's just like, give me a chance. Let me come up. She drove from Virginia up for a face-to-face -face interview. And I met her and I was like, you're it. You've got a spot. So some of it is just, you know, things happen the way they're supposed to. So, um, Amazing. yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. I don't know. Caroline, did you want, um, um, well, I think, I think that's, that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm <laughs> tearing up. Over <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm thinking about my, my carrots that I just planted. I'm like, Oh no, did I do, did I, did I cut any corners on that bed? <laughs> <laughs> Existential terror about the carrots. <laughs> um, but yeah, back to, back to some quick, um, future harvest housekeeping stuff. Uh, if anybody hasn't filled out the poll yet, it's still live. And if you don't mind filling that out, it would be really incredibly helpful for us. Um, it does help us understand what you're looking for in terms of educational materials. Um, and Zoom doesn't let us ask open-ended questions. So if there's feedback that you have um, or you know, anything you wanna tell us, um, our email addresses should all be on the website in the chat box and um, you can write things in the chat box or send them directly to us. Uh, Lisa, thank you. It was fun. Thank, thank you very much. Everybody for <laughs> showing up. It was a good learning experience to do my first webinar. All right. Amazing. And thank you to your enthusiastic intern with those great video clips. Oh yeah, yeah I will. She's awesome. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to buy her a little treat for, for <laughs> some beef sticks now. perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She doesn't eat beef. Maybe she's <laughs> wine though. She drinks wine. All right. Thanks everybody. Have a great season. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks. Take care and everybody stay safe. You too. Thanks.